So, okay. So, happy birthday, Anton. <laughs> okay. Uh, Christian and I are going to talk about graphons and graphexes. This is now, oh wow, probably 14 years of work on this. Uh, so I'm going to be covering a lot. I'm not going to be giving proofs of anything. Christian may give some proofs. I'm in in part one. I'm focusing uh, on graphons, and he'll focus on graphexes. Okay, which are much newer. So the motivation is three related problems. I move my head a lot, so I wouldn't, but anyway, okay. It's three related problems. The first one, the one that we considered a long time ago, we were working uh, on some algorithms for the World Wide Web. Literally, we were looking at the World Wide Web, and we said, you know, this is just crazy. This is such a big object. There must be some reasonable notion of a limit. And we went and we asked our colleagues in combinatorics and graph theory, and to our amazement, there really been essentially no work on this. And so, you know, it's not obvious what the notion should be. If you make the notion uh, too weak, every graph will converge to the, or every sequence of graphs will converge to the same point. If you make the notion too strong, every sequence will converge to a different point. So uh, we spent many years in collaboration. We had like a five-person uh, five collaboration. Christian and I, Latsi Lovas, Kadi Vestragambi, and Vera Shoj, coming up with maybe six different notions for dense graphs and showing that they were all the same. OK, then uh, a while later, uh, probably five or six years ago at the uh, largest ML conference, largest machine learning conference, we went there and people were actually using our graphons to estimate uh, large graphs and to machine learn large, large networks like Facebook. And so we asked, OK, we, we had already asked, how do you model, given a graph on, how do you model a graph? But then could we uh, non-parametrically estimate, statistically consistently estimate these large graphs? And then finally, uh, can we use graph limits to construct algorithms on networks? OK, so how do we look at the graph limit and have an algorithm which operates on the limit. And I'll give an example of this later. OK, so graphs have a vertex set, and they have an edge set. And the edge set is specified by a matrix, a symmetric matrix, if it's an undirected graph. And what we're going to do is take a limit. Here is the little, um, there. Is it, oh, Jesus. Not what I meant to do. OK, is this guy working? Not, well, yeah, it's working. OK, so we take a limit that gives us, instead of a vertex set, a sigma finite measure space. And instead of, um, instead of the matrix that represents the edges, we get a symmetric measurable function on that, uh, on that feature space, we call it. OK, then if you have such a function, OK, you can use it to generate realizations of this graph, OK? So you can, uh, if, if the function were the constant function on, you know, on a finite space, then the graph you would generate would just be the random graph at the value of that function. So if the function is just a constant 1 half, you generate the 1 half random graph. But if it's a more complicated function, you generate more interesting graphs. And then, as I said, when we went to this ML conference about five years ago, then we started to ask, how can we 
given one of these large graphs like Facebook or LinkedIn, how do we show that we can get a statistically consistent estimate of it in terms of such a function? And then finally, we've got some applications. OK, so I'm first going to talk about dense graph limits. That was that you know, 10, 10 year collaboration. Uh, we, we did some sparse graphs of bounded degree in there, but really what we wanted to look at were sparse graphs of unbounded degree, like power law graphs and that kind of thing. And so we actually came up with two different ways of doing that. About five years ago, four years ago, we came up with one way, which is kind of in terms of some LP functions. And then we came up with another way a couple of years ago, which is more of a statistician's way of doing things. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, how we use this to model graphs, at least how we use one of those two notions to model, well, both of them. And then I'll talk about estimating and predicting networks. So can we statistically consistently estimate networks? And finally, I'll talk about um, an application. OK, so first, a heuristic picture of this. Um, we, have, um, we have an adjacency matrix. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if I have a certain graph here, um, I'm going to represent it as an adjacency matrix. And, I'm, and if I would have put a 1, I'll color it black. And then, oh, the limit is just this. It's just that picture. And here, I have a random graph with p equals a half, and the limit looks like this. And it just becomes the constant function, and I could have other things there. Now, you might ask, what about permutations of the vertices? This looks like that. And so it turns out that the, um, the permutation symmetry of the graph turns into, in the graphon sense, um, that the graphon is unique only up to a measure-preserving bijection. OK, so you can really mix things up in lots of ways. And this was something that we did with Latsi Lovas, published around 2010. And just this morning, our extension of this to GraphXs, which was done with Henry Cohn and younger Latsi Lovas, it, we thought this was a complicated paper. The new one is. 108 pages long. That just got accepted. So, um, so trying to do this for the kinds of things that Christian is going to talk about is really a mess. And we needed another generation of low losses to help us with that. OK, so left convergence for dense graphs. So why is this called left convergence? You may hear people talk about left and right. It's because we are looking at homomorphisms of a small set, K, into the vertex set. OK, so given a, a graph f on k vertices, so you can think of an edge on two vertices, a triangle, a fourth cycle, a Peterson graph, um, I want to look at a homomorphism that maps edges in f into edges in, in g. OK? And then I want to define the homomorphism density as the probability that, as, as the probability that a random map is a homomorphism. Some of the mappings are not going to be homomorphisms. And so basically, with inclusion, exclusion, what you get are subgraph densities. You, you can get you know, densities of, um, of edges and triangles and four cycles and that kind of thing. And we said that a sequence of dense graphs is left convergent or subgraph convergent if these densities converge for all finite graphs. So that seems pretty strong. OK, these densities have to converge for every finite graph. OK, then we came up with another notion which seems very different. That first notion seemed very local. Here, we're going to test a large graph from the right by mapping v into a subset of in, into a small set k rather than k into v. What is this? This is really a statistical physics problem or a multi-way cut problem. So what I want to do is I want to say that I'm going to look at a microcanonical ground state energy. I can, I can look at balanced ones if I want. It doesn't make any difference. So I, I want there to be roughly the same number of red and green and blue and yellow. So that's k is 4. OK, here's a picture of k equals 3. And 
normalized because I have a dense graph like this. This is the energy, the microcanonical energy. And what I want to say is that something is right convergent if all microcanonical ground state energies converge. So for all, you know, all divisions of into four colors, five colors, eight colors, this converges. So these sound very different from each other. Okay. And and we call that right convergent. Okay? And for all J's? For all J's. Okay, so so the first thing that Mark Mazar <laughs> said when he looked at this is oh, that means you could do spin glasses, and we can, but with this normalization, of spin glasses trivial, right? So <laughs> Right, because we're, we're normalizing by 1 over n squared, not by 1 over n, OK? So if you, you know, really have random signs, this is the wrong normalization. So everything I say is true, but not particularly interesting for dense graphs. OK, so what is a graph limit? So now we could say it's a collection of probability distributions on finite graphs. OK, edges, triangles, et cetera. Or we could say it's a collection of microcanonical ground state energies. We could define a graph on over a sigma finite, finite measure space to be an integrable function, symmetric integrable function over that space. And, and if we do that, then I can represent any graph as a graph on, because if I have a graph on n vertices, I can take the unit square and cut it up into n squared little pieces, and it just is piecewise constant there, right? Whatever, if an, if an edge is there, then I have a 1. And otherwise, I, I have zero. So any graph can be trivially represented as a piecewise constant graph on, on the unit square. OK, so there is a metric on matrices, actually, that goes back to Fries and Conan in 99. They called it the cup metric. So instead of thinking of a W1 and a W2, just think of a W, OK? And what this measures is the maximum cut through your graph. Because what I'm doing, I can think of T as S complement. It's only going to get bigger if I just have one W. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to maximize this, OK? So I'm trying to maximize, and then I would take an absolute value. So I'm trying to maximize the cut. Now, what if I take a difference of two graphons, or think of graphs, and I've got piecewise constant graphons? OK, I would say that that's the cut distance, but that wouldn't be quite right. What I really have to do is I really have to um, do an inf over all measure-preserving bijections, OK? Because it's just like if I, I mean, I would call two graphs the same up, up, if, if the vertices were a permutation of each other. And in the same way, I have to call two functions the same here if they are measure-preserving bijections. And in fact, if things get a little more complicated, which they will later, then a measure-preserving bijection won't be enough. We'll have to put in couplings and things like that. There was a very famous statistician who did something like this and just used a measure of preserving bijection, and there are counterexamples. So when it gets a little more complicated, you actually have to use couplings. OK, and we say that a sequence of graphs converges to a graph on W in this, in, in metric, so this is metric convergence, if the empirical graphons converge to W in the cut metric. So now we've got three notions. We've got the notion of subgraph convergence. Seems very local, OK? All these densities converge. We've got the notion of microcanonical ground state energies converging. And we've got a notion of metric convergence. Metric, of course, is really nice because it gives you analytic control. OK, so uh, in this series of papers, we said a sequence of graphs is a Cauchy sequence in the cut metric, if and only if it's left convergent, which is also, um, also equivalent to right convergent. Um, Lovaj and Balaj Segeti said, for any left convergent sequence, there exists a graph on, OK, if, if um, such that the limiting subgraph frequencies can be expressed as this. It wasn't a very complicated argument. It was a martingale. Um, a martingale argument, and then um, 
plus plus the local lemma, yeah. But um, later, Percy Diaconis and Svante Janssen realized actually you can get this from the other things we were doing just with the, uh, uh, the Aldous Hoover theorem, which I'll mention a little later if you don't know it, but it's a two-dimensional version, um, two version of De Finetti's theorem, okay? Okay, and then, so putting it all together, left convergence is equivalent to both metric convergence to a W and right, so they had gotten it to a particular W, or right convergence, um, they are also, they also turn out to, to be equivalent to some other notions. So right convergence is just convergence of the microcanonical free energies. You also can get convergence, this is another global notion, of all max cuts, min bisections, multi-way cuts and bisections. Okay, so that's, that is yet another notion of convergence. Then there's a convergence of quotients, which you basically are contracting everything of the same color to a point, and, mod, and so you're modding that out. Um, and then a few years later with uh, David Gamarnik, we looked at convergence of a large deviation rate corresponding to an entropy in the microcanonical ensemble in which we're not only then holding the uh, vertex densities fixed, but also the edge densities. And, and looking at what's left. So for dense graph sequences, all these things are the same, okay? Um, which is really, really nice. The combinatorialists really loved it because they all of a sudden had a way of dealing with all these local densities that they love. And so they were able to go and reprove a lot of theorems in extremal combinatorics using using these, these densities in much the same way that, you know, things are sometimes easier if you look at a differential equation than if you look at an interacting particle system. If you look at an, inter an interacting particle system, you're not only dealing with the dominant behavior, but you've got all the lower order terms as well. And so this is kind of like differential equations to interacting particle systems. So proofs get simpler if all you care about is the dominant behavior. Okay, so with Lotsi Lovas and Jeff Kahn, we, um, we looked at sparse graphs. They're much more fragile. Uh, and there was already a notion of benjamini schramm convergence in which you pick a random vertex and you look at the tree you grow rooted from that vertex. And it turns out with Lotsi and Jeff, um, what we proved was that subgraph convergence is the same as benjamini schramm convergence which is the same as convergence of the free energies. And this is a strict, I, well, sorry, which is implied by convergence of free energies, which is a strictly stronger notion in the low temperature phase. And then with David Gamarnik, we prove that this is implied by large deviations convergence, which throughout the ordered and disordered phase is a strictly stronger notion. So all these things that turned out to be equivalent in the case of dense graphs, for sparse graphs of bounded degree, they can really be different. Some are stronger than the others. Pardon? What is subgraph convergence? Subgraph convergence is basically the same as the convergence of those densities. So that's edge density and or, or homomorphism <laughs> densities. <laughs> yes, sorry, of course, yes. You need the right normalization here. Okay, so what we really cared about though and what the rest of, uh, of the talk, when I talk about a sparse graph, I'm gonna talk about a sparse graph of unbounded degree or a sequence of graphs of unbounded degree. So rho n, the density of the graphs times n has to go to infinity, okay? So rho n is gonna go to zero, that tells me it's a sparse graph, rho sub n, but n times rho n will go to infinity. So it's a sparse graph of unbounded degree. And the limit is previously defined as zero because I should have been normalizing by one over n, not by one over n squared, basically. Okay, so what do I do about that? So um, Bolarbosch and Reardon had done some stuff in a particular case in um, 2010 and then with Henry Cohn and Yu Fei Zhao. In 2015, we said, okay, well let us normalize, so let's, divide by the, by the L1 norm of the empirical graph on, okay? So then this 
this gets bigger because I'm dividing through by something that's getting smaller. And I'm going to define the rescaled graph on, OK? And I'm going to say GN is convergent if these rescaled graphons dividing through by 1 over the L1 norm, it's convergent to W if, if that distance goes to 0. Same kind of cut norm as, as before. So that's the notion of metric convergence. And this turns out to be equivalent to rate convergence under suitable regularity conditions. So that was a you know, a very long paper with Henry and Yufei. But basically, what we were doing was we were looking at something which you, you can't look at LP norms of, of these things because um, that turns out to be too strong a notion. And so we basically were looking at local averages of LP norms, which in some way modded out the Semiretti partition. So that was the kind of regularity condition that we used. OK, we could do something entirely different from this. So again, with Henry Cohn and Nina Holden, who at least one of you has collaborated with Nina. Um, she just went to uh, Eteha to be, um, uh, to be Vendelin's uh, postdoc. She turned down a tenure track in Stanford math to do that. So I guess she, she's confident she'll get another great job. Uh, anyway, so we did this with her. And we said, you know, you, you could either divide through by the L1 norm, or you could stretch the underlying space by square root of the L1 norm. So now, instead of being a unit square with these very large Ws, we're going to replace the unit square by the whole positive quadrant. So these things are stretched out now. And we say, you know, it's convergent to a graph on W if this cut distance, the, the analogous cut distance goes to 0. And this turns out, and it took us years, we just realized this in the last year or two, um, it's equivalent to a modified version of left convergence, which Christian is going to talk about. Um, under suitable, uh, suitable regularity conditions. So notions of convergence for sparse graphs. Without extra technical conditions, mass can disappear up with the rescaled ones or out to infinity with the, um, uh, with the stretched ones. And we also don't get subsequential convergence for arbitrary sequences without some notion. So we came up with notions of uniform upper and uh, uh, uniform upper regularity and uniformly regular tails. This is, these are many talks which we're not going to give here. Um, and then people asked us, wow, can you get something that converges in both senses? OK, that would be nice. Well, it turns out this is only true for dense graphs. So only a dense graph will converge in both of these senses. OK, and it has to have divergent average, if either of these converges, it has to have divergent average degree. OK, the advantages of the first definition, um, sparse power law graphs converge, um, and it's equivalent to right convergence. And the second notion, it gives convergence of very long of things with very long tails. Oh, yeah. This random graph here, the Elder Shenyi, I guess, and you're in a situation where NPN goes to infinity. Yeah, but it's not Erdish Renyi. It's no, GNP. Is. Oh, GNP. I'm sorry. Absolutely, yes. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yes, this is an Erdish Renyi. So there, Erdish Renyi's. The interesting stuff happens when P is not a constant, but it's going like you know one over n or something. Yeah. So it, if it's a function of n. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So it turns out that if you study statistical physics model on these, and you normalize them in the paramagnetic normalization, so that you actually get a mean field theory out, which gives a variation of principle in terms of these graph forms. And, and we were able to prove things about phase transitions in terms of eigenvalues and stuff for GNPN using these. So it, it actually turns out to be a nice way to, to look at this. OK, and the stretching one, you get these very long tails. Christian will talk a little more about that. OK, 
So now, um, now what I wanna ask is, how do I actually try to model a real network? And what people did for years was use the stochastic block model, which many of you know it has K communities, and it says, you know, if you're in community red, then you're connected to another red with a certain probability, or you're connected to blue or green or whatever with a probability that just depends on your color and the color of the person you're, you're connecting to, okay? And I could scale these probabilities with a target density row n to obtain a sparse graph out of it, okay? So there's a, and, and, and the statisticians called it the stochastic block matrix because, you know, you get this block of k choose two parameters. Okay, there was a lot of work on estimation in, in the statistics community, assuming that your model really was a stochastic block model, okay? There are a few problems with this. One, if it's not a stochastic block model, okay, which is what I mean by misspecification, then it's not clear what the stability of the result is. You say something, if it's not a stochastic block model, do you, do you get anything from the theorem? And the other thing is that when people tried to do this, as the, as the graphs got larger and larger, so, you know, like Facebook or like the web, then K, they landed up having to have K scale with N to get some reasonable fit. Okay, in which case your number of parameters diverged. Okay, and, that, and they laid it up overfitting. Yeah. So an alternative is a non-parametric approach started in the statistics community in 02. Um, and, and so, or this is the really, you know, people in the combinatorics community have thought about things like this too, but not for sparse graphs. So instead of a matrix indexed by these K communities, Use a function based on features, okay? So now I'm gonna think I'm in Facebook and let's say I'm characterized by, you know, uh, my, my age, okay? And I'm characterized by what country I'm from and I'm characterized by uh, my intelligence if I believe there's a one parameter way to measure to measure intelligence, or better yet, my kind of intelligence in physics, my intelligence in math, my, you know, my affinity for art, my how much I like Chinese food, and all these other things. And I'm gonna connect to somebody else who has these features based on what this function is gonna tell me about the feature. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate these IID points, those are, each of those can be multi-dimensional. They're, you know, so, so X1 is me and X2 is Kristen and X3 is Michael. And for each of us, there's this, there's, you know, this feature space, okay? And then I'm going to connect to people with a probability W of XI and XJ. Depends on their latent features. That's the probability that I'm going to say that we connect on Facebook. And I'd better scale it by row n, because otherwise, you know, it might not be a probability. Okay, and I call the resulting random graph an inhomogeneous random graph at target density row n, and I denote it by this. But it's being, if, if w is a constant function, that's just your good old random graph. If it's not, you know, it's gonna depend on all these features. And the relation to rescaled convergence is that this, this thing that we just constructed here converges to W in the rescaled cut metric if the density is going to zero, if, if the, the density is going to zero and the average degree is blowing up. Okay, there's a totally different thing that I could do, which was started by the, uh, the statisticians, uh, uh, Carone and Emily Fox. Um, so let me take a sigma finite measure space and a graph on, and I'm gonna do the following. I'm gonna have a Poisson process. And so for t greater than zero, I'm gonna have these points of a Poisson process, but each of these points is really a whole set of features, okay? 
So Christian is born, I'm born, Michael is born, with our sets of features with an intensity t times a measure mu. OK, the measure mu from this sigma finite measure space. Uh, density. And now I'm going to connect i and j with this probability. I'm not scaling by a row anymore. I'm going to remove the isolated vertices, and I'm going to come up with a finite graph at time t. So let's just look at this. Um, Christian is born with this set of features, and I'm born with this set of features, and Michael is born with this set of features. I'm representing them in one dimension, but they're in a high dimensional space, and Anton is born with this set of features. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip my coins, OK? And so Christian lands up connecting to Michael and Anton. What? Number one. Oh, you're number one. Oh, Christian lands up connecting to nobody. That, that's why you had to be number one. And I land up connecting <laughs> to Michael and Anton based on our features. And you don't see Christian because he was an isolated ver vertex that so we took him out. However, what happens by time two is that three other people are born with their features. And my coins are flipped again. I keep the coins for the first four people. And so now what happens is number seven comes in. So Frank is number seven, and he comes in and connects with Christian, and so they both appear, OK? And then also somebody else who came in connects with me and Anton, and number five, nobody's connected yet. These are the, these are the future people that Facebook want that have been born, but they haven't connected on Facebook yet. What? what? You're not on Facebook, so no, you're so then you're number five. You're that isolated vertex, but they're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. <laughs> okay, so relation. So this one turns out to be related to stretch convergence. So this thing converges to W in the stretched cut metric. Okay, and the, this turns out to be really interesting and different. The statisticians for obvious reasons, like this one. I mean, these are, this is a projective set. So the rescaled one is not projective in that when I keep renormalizing by the density, I wipe out the previous one. So it's not like the other ones are, are subsets of the later graphs. Here, they, they are. OK, so uh, the, the, the rescaled ones look a little bit like this. And the stretched ones, really, they go out very far, very, very low density. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to work just on the first model. Christian will talk about things related to the second. OK, so estimation. So this was <laughs> a really long paper, but I'll just tell you what, what we did. We said, what I want to do is I want to estimate. So I'm at Facebook, and I want to get W for Facebook. I want to be able to hand any employee who walks in the Facebook, the, the, you know, the function for the Facebook graph, OK? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate it by the best k block approximation to the adjacency matrix. So I'm going to look at something of size k, OK, uh, a matrix of size k, and I'm going to Look at all, you know, all possible matrices of size k with all permutations, and I'm going to see which is closest in L2 to my adjacency matrix when I blow it up properly and I and I permute everything. So it may be that yeah, all the ones were here, but then when I permuted everything, I put them in different places so that it's now the same size as a, but it really comes from just a k block, and. I'm going to output the empirical graph on corresponding to this. So this is going to be my estimate. And what we showed, and as I said, is a really long involved thing. But as n tends to infinity, the empirical, this empirical graph on gives the best possible block model uh, approximation to W in, in this least squares, um, in this least squares metric, as long as W is L2, the density goes to 0. And the um, and the um, the average degree goes to infinity. Okay. So this is for fixed k, right? This yes. yes. So the, uh, it's the best block model with k communities or something. 
Yes, but in, and then in the next thing I'm gonna tell you about, I'm, I'm gonna force K to have to scale with N in some way, but yes. Yes, but this just says I can statistically consistently estimate. It doesn't tell me how to do it, okay? So, you know, it's an NP complete problem to do it, but at least we know it's possible to, to do it. When I gave this at a big um, industry conference called Strata, everyone's like, can I have your code? Can I have your code? I'm like, you know, and I'm like, I don't have a code, I have a theorem. And the theorem is not fast. <laughs> the theorem is existential. Okay, so private network estimation. So privacy problem for databases. You know, it, can I release statistical information? Can I answer questions from a database without revealing too much about people in the database? It's even harder for a, a network. Like uh, already eight years ago, there was a paper that showed that with high probability on Facebook, they can guess your, um, they can guess your uh, sexual orientation just by looking at your Facebook links, okay? Because, you know, you, uh, it's not surprising, okay? So much worse than just a database all your connections say a lot about you. And naive anonymization can be undone, so we need a more principled approach. You may have heard of differential privacy, so this is a network version of differential privacy. I say that something is epsilon differentially private if any event that I look at, okay, if I'm in the graph or I'm not in the graph, the probability of that event is only gonna differ by epsilon, one plus or minus epsilon. I mean, it's e to the minus or e to the plus epsilon, right? So basically, you know, uh, you're, you're not gonna really be able to tell whether I'm in the graph or I'm not in the graph. Okay, there's an analogous definition for edge privacy, which is not nearly as hard to achieve, but it's not very useful because I can't say to you, don't worry, Christian, I'm gonna pull out a particular edge because all of his other edges could reveal information on him. And the previous work was individual graph statistics, edge privacy and dense graphs. Um, so we wanted to say something about sparse graphs and we use the so-called um, the so-called exponential mechanism, which says that what I want to do is I want to output a kind of noisy version of of the identity matrix of of, um, of the adjacency matrix. And so what we did in 2015 with Adam Smith, who's one of the the um, the original people on the differential privacy paper. Um, is we said if W is bounded, and this and now the average degree has to go to infinity fast enough, um, then you can do this differentially privately. And we added um, Ilya Sadiq, who's David Gamarnik's student, this past summer, and we found there are a lot of people in the statistics community who are doing. Um, bounds on uh, bounds on optimal, essentially optimal bounds on the estimation problem, not differentially privately. And we showed that we can get something which goes smoothly into the optimal bounds. Okay, so we've done this. So given a graph, I can take a limit. Given one of these functions, I can use it to generate more interesting graphs than just your random graph, okay? Than just your Erdős Renyi random graph. And given a function, I can, it, it, given a real graph, I can statistically consistently estimate the function that represents it, though I don't know how to compute it quickly. And now, um, I'm gonna focus on this application in the last five minutes. And so I'm gonna give you um, a way to estimate recommendations on sparse bipartite network, networks like Netflix or completion of a sparsely sampled social network. <coughs> so let's look at this. I have people and I have movies and I have ratings, okay? So this is a matrix completion problem. I wanna guess how much 
you know, this grandma is going to like this movie here, okay? Or a network, network completion problem. So uh, a development economists, I mean, I talked to some who are really excited about this because they sparsely sample who's connected to whom in these social networks in India, okay? And they want to guess from this who else might be connected to whom from their sparse sampling. And of course, there's a weighted network completion problem. So, you know, she likes... Um, this, so this would be a directed graph, or it could be the average likes going back and forth, the number of emails that are exchanged, so instead of ones and zeros, you, you have a weighted graph. And so it's a matrix completion problem. So I want to know for the grandma and the, you know, and the, I don't know, the Terminator movie, like how much is, is she going to like it on the basis of the very few things that she's rated? So it turns out that the Aldous-Hoover theorem is, a, is very, very useful here. This is um, for, for dense graphs. But Aldous-Hoover, if you don't know it, is a two-dimensional generalization of Definetti's theorem. Definetti's theorem you know, is a miracle the first time you read it, right? Because what it says, I mean, just think of the poly urn. It says, like, all I have to know is the density, and then you know, and uh, the, 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 the density of red and black balls, even though you know that a priori, you know, uh, the, the, what I'm going to do de depends on what I last did, right? But if I condition on the ergodic component, and if I condition on this one parameter, the density, then I'm done. So all this Hoover reinterpreted in light of the results on graphons says that if I have an infinite dense array of dependent random variables, which are exchangeable and ergodic, so I better be in the one ergodic component, then there exists a feature space such that if you condition on the ergodic component and the features of all the vertices, the entries of the array are independent. The distribution will depend only on the feature. So there's a lot more dependence here than just saying, oh, it depends on the density of red balls and black balls, okay. But what this says is that there's less dependence than there should a priori be. So it is a, a two-dimensional version. What this says for us is that our matrix depends on the features of the people, the features of the movies, and some independent random variables, which without loss of generality, I can take randomly in zero, one. By the way, there is a sparse array generalization of Definetti, much more complicated than Aldous Hoover, which Christian may mention, but it's integral to all the graphics stuff. OK, so we have this latent variable model I just told you as a corollary to Aldous Hoover. It's of this form. I'm going to take an expectation over that little epsilon, that uniform epsilon. And now I'm going to observe each entry independently with probability p. So I have sparsely sampled this graph. It's just, you know, I, 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 I've sampled whether this person likes this movie and that, but it's sparsely sampled. And so, and this denotes the dimension of the latent space. These could be different, and I might just take the max of those. So how many? Features of movies are relevant, genre, year, actors, directors, how many features of people are relevant, you know. Okay, and then what I want is I want that if I have this observed matrix that I see in Netflix, can we learn this or even more, you know, I, I could do this separately for one star, two stars, three stars, four stars, five stars, and I could learn the, the distribution of these five different matrices. So ideally, I'd like to estimate this for very sparse sampling, P going like 1 over N, OK, if I have like N people in N movies, OK? Uh, Chatterjee has results from 2015, which give this, but they require much, um, much more samples than you could reasonably have. So here's the challenge of sparsity. There, oops. There's no overlap here, so what do I do? Okay, I mean, here's this little girl, she's seen these two movies, this little boy, he's seen these two movies, 
And I say, you know, they're similar if their neighbors are similar. They're similar if they like similar movies, but there's no overlap in their movies. So after um, Abe Sandin, so this is Emmanuel and his student, Colin Sandin, um, we said, let's go out in, in distance. Okay, and, and really that was also based on some work by Elkanan and Andrea and, and others. So let's, let's go out further. So now let me look at these movies and how other people rated them. And now let me go out from these people to other movies and lo and behold, I get some overlap. How far out do I have to go to get some overlap? The birthday paradox tells us that I want the boundary to be bigger than square root of n, and then I'm gonna have a reasonable chance of overlap. And so that tells me what this radius has to be, where p is the sampling density. And now I'm gonna compare the product ratings along the path. And I can basically do this in terms of like an operator product expansion based on these W's and traces over these W's. And the theorem says that if W is Lipschitz, oh, by the way, the reason that people like these for fitting things is because if I have to have K of N parameters to fit, okay, it's just gonna start to explode and I'm gonna overfit. But in, if instead I say, I wanna fit it with a W, now I can put some reasonable conditions in a W. It's Lipschitz or something, okay? So, assuming W is Lipschitz in rank D, and I observe it with probability going like one over N times D squared, this mean squared error goes to zero, and in fact, if P is a little bit bigger than with high probability, this difference goes to zero, much better than the Chatterjee result, and it allows for general bounded noise and other things. So, Dense graphs, we have metric convergence, left convergence, right convergence, many other notions. Sparse graphs, I didn't really tell you what the regularity conditions are, but we have these two different ways of getting sparse graphs of unbounded degree, either by dividing through by the L1 norm and having the Ws get bigger, or by stretching our underlying space by square root of the L1 norm of W, and we get convergence in various ways here. Graphons provide a non-parametric model to generate random graphs. So this is what I ran into when I went to this conference. People were finding the graphon representing whatever their company's graph was. Um, and we can consistently estimate for very general unbounded average degree sparse graphs and consistently and differentially privately estimate if the W is bounded, and um, we can also uh, have new matrix completion algorithms. So happy birthday, Anton.